We would now like to begin the 2023 Spring Open House. This event is also being live streamed in YouTube. Please give a round of applause as we welcome our Dean to the podium for the opening remarks. Hello, everyone. Uh, I was expecting a huge crowd, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think the latest uh, COVID situation, uh, uh, given that it is wise to, to have this meeting <coughs> uh, with a relatively modest size of uh, offline gathering, and uh, I expect uh, many people joining us uh, online. So uh, on behalf of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, uh, I am delighted uh, to have you all uh, join this uh, uh, open house event. And uh, for the last two years, we had this uh, event only on, online, I, I believe. And uh, for the first time in two years, uh, three years, I guess, uh, uh, we have uh, some of you, at least, uh, on our campus. And that's very uh, <clears throat> uh, pleasing. And uh, also, uh, this year, we are commemorating the 25th anniversary of KDI School's uh, foundation in 1997. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure all KDI School faculty and staff and students are with me in welcoming you to this event. We are very pleased and excited to have you here, and we hope you are as well. COVID-19 has changed many aspects of our lives, including the way we teach and learn. Uh, KDI School has vigorously pursued educational innovation during the pandemic. Of course, before the pandemic, too. Uh, we reconfigured our classrooms to provide the best technological support for online and hybrid classes. We have introduced AI-based adaptive learning methods, which has been very helpful in catering to each student's different learning needs. We reinforced our curricula by launching a new concentration, data science for public policy and management, in response to the demands of our time. Finally, we are launching a part-time PhD in public policy and management program to meet the needs of the senior government officials starting next spring. Well, there have been many other uh, uh, developments uh, uh, at the school, but I'm not going to belabor them. KDI School is proud of its world-class faculty and staff who are committed to providing you with a top-notch educational experience. We also take great pride in our student body that is not only highly qualified, but truly diverse in terms of cultural and professional backgrounds. The mission of KDI School is to foster future leaders who will chart the ways for a sustainable and shared development around the world. The world desperately needs such leaders. Climate disasters are wreaking havoc around the world. And the pandemic is continuing to threaten our lives. Wars and conflicts are ravaging many parts of the world while international cooperation is faltering. Globalization is in retreat and stagflation is approaching. We need visionary, competent global leaders to lead us forward in these challenging and uncertain times. We are here 
to do our part in tackling these problems. And we are looking for students who want to become such leaders. We promise that we'll make every effort to help you realize your dream once you join us. I hope today's open house will convince you to seriously consider applying to KDI school. And look forward to meeting many of you on campus come next spring. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean, for your wonderful remarks. Now, Professor Changun Lee, the MDP Program Field Chair, will come up to the stage to talk about making public policy better. Please welcome Professor Lee to the stage. So, uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, my job is to uh, let you know uh, what we do and what uh, we're good at within seven minutes, <laughs> which is the uh, most difficult uh, task in my entire career. So uh, let me start uh, by introducing myself. Uh, I'm an economic historian, so I study uh, the history of economy to uh, draw the lessons for the present and for the future. And I uh, do that uh, by analyzing uh, micro data of individuals, a household, and firm. So I'm an uh, applied uh, microeconomist. And here I teach uh, Korean economic development, so economic history of Korea after uh, the independence, and economic history. So uh, students uh, ask me very difficult questions like this. How did Korea uh, grow so fast? And what did the government do? <laughs> and most importantly, uh, can we be the same? So can we be like Korea if we do the same as uh, Korea did in the past? So uh, I could see that uh, they had in mind some image like this from Korea's past experience. Like there's a strong uh, leader right, uh, uh, coming up with a great uh, plan to uh, drive the country into uh, economic uh, prosperity, and they're strong and capable uh, state. So I did some research to develop uh, a new version of Korean uh, economic development, and I could see that uh, there was uh, some kind of division of labor uh, between the public sector and the private sector. So the government knew uh, what to do and what not to do. And to ensure that, they did many things that uh, the private sector at that time couldn't do well, such as uh, intense analysis. You know that KDI was founded in uh, 1972, right? And they, uh, they were supposed to give some intellectual support, right? And that's what they did. And they want to share the information and analysis so that uh, every economic agent could be informed. And they uh, worked hard to uh, build consensus, right? And they spent a lot of time, uh, every time they make a, a, a policy decision, uh, they spend a lot of time in deliberation. So uh, thinking uh, collectively and um, uh, thinking of some uh, other uh, alternatives to uh, come up with the best options, and uh, coordination between different uh, government branches and between public and private, right? And most importantly, they uh, were, I mean, uh, they were, they were, uh, they were uh, spending a lot of time and energy also in feedback process and uh, making uh, policies uh, adapt to a changing environment. So, to this question, to, to the questions of students, uh, I say that uh, maybe the true uh, lesson or lessons of uh, Korean economic development is that having a good policy cycle and having good policymakers who know uh, what to do and what not to do is truly uh, important. And that maybe 
the true secret to uh, the Korean economic development, right? So I say to students, like, we need to learn about how rather than what. Like, we can't expect the government to play the same role uh, as in the, you know, 1960s and 70s, right? Because uh, our challenges are evolving as well, right? And the environment is changing. So we have very complex and uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, challenges like this. Uh, digital technology and inequality and changing uh, global politics, right? And growing tensions between the G2 nations and uh, environmental problems, right? And we are I mean, struggling uh, uh, because we have a lot of uh, polarized uh, politics that makes it extremely difficult to tackle these complex uh, challenges in the right way. Right? But I think there are some promises uh, like uh, evidence-based policymaking, uh, data science, and, pu uh, and public communication. I think uh, these uh, areas are what we do well. <laughs> So I, I want to uh, give you a sense of what uh, these are and how uh, we uh, teach you and how we uh, do research in these areas. So uh, evidence-based policymaking means that, uh, as it says, uh, policymaking should be based on uh, causal evidence. It's not like comparing before and after. It's about uh, examining the effect of uh, individual policies in a scientific way. So we, uh, our curriculum focuses much on causal uh, impact evaluation, and uh, we try to incorporate important uh, elements such as uh, policy uh, experiments into the curriculum and research agenda. And eventually, uh, each proven uh, policy uh, must be scaled up so that uh, the vast majority of people could benefit from our discovery and our analysis, right? So these are what usually economists do, but these days, political scientists and other social scientists do this. And data science, uh, this is well, uh, it's, it's well known that it it's allows us, like uh, text analysis allows us to read uh, public opinions that uh, numbers, like poll numbers do not show, right? And it also uh, enables us to analyze the policymaking process because these days, uh, scholars uh, mine and analyze the committee minutes to understand the structure of policymaking and therefore uh, uh, to, uh, we can improve uh, the quality of policymaking as well. And it identifies social networks so we have better understanding of how political uh, opinions shape and emerge and affect uh, policymaking. And you know that there is a growing gap between experts because science uh, develops uh, constantly, so the gap between expert and ordinary people uh, grows uh, uh, more and more. So it's important to bring, uh, bring, bring the uh, outcomes of uh, so, uh, rigorous research to uh, policymaking and people, right? So this, uh, in, so this involves not just science, but also arts of uh, persuading and convincing the stakeholders, right? So this is important, and to do that, we need to identify uh, best practices and make that kind of applicable to our everyday lives, right? And you know that we're living in the times of conflict, conflict between you know, different genders and different nations and different uh, groups, right? So post, uh, public communication uh, is important uh, more than ever, right? So these are all uh, what we do and what we have in our curriculum. So uh, I uh, expect you to um, uh, have uh, good knowledge and good uh, skills in those areas. But, uh, and and I, I believe uh, Professor Ji Yumin will uh, give you a better sense of uh, <laughs> what we're going to do uh, in um, each master program, but let me conclude by saying like this. Here, uh, you're gonna learn many skills, but uh, more importantly, uh, you will find your own important policy questions, and 
you can look for uh, the answers to the questions, not alone, but uh, with all of us uh, all together so that we can uh, build uh, a good community dedicated to uh, better policy making. Right? So uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, Open House uh, events uh, and let me uh, finish here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your impressive session. Next, Professor Yu Min Ju, the Director of Learning Innovation Center, will lead you through the information session of KDI School. Please welcome Professor Ju to the stage. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to introduce our school to you. I'll be covering um, four areas, uh, vision and the history of KDI school, and of course, most importantly, uh, why you should consider joining the KDI school. A brief introduction to our degree programs, and finally, our admission schedule. So let's get started with the vision and history of our school. Our vision is to become an education hub for future policy leaders. We continuously strive to bring innovation into our teaching, and we want to make sure that our graduates have the necessary skill sets to become successful leaders and managers in today's fast-changing and globalized society. Our school was established in 1997, and we started off with just 55 students. Today, we have 6,700 alumni. Three of our master's programs, MPP, MPM, and MDP, are accredited by NASPA. We also have a joint program with the World Intellectual Property Organization and the Korean Intellectual Property Office for master's in intellectual property and development policy. We recently launched a dual concentration in data science for public policy and management. And as the dean briefly mentioned, we also have two new programs that are conducted in Korean, a master's degree and a doctorate degree in public policy and management. And actually, if you join for the um, PhD program, this admission around, you'll be the first batch of the program. All right, so then, why should you consider applying to our school? As I mentioned before, uh, we are the only and the first NASPA accredited institution in Korea, and we collaborate closely with our sister institute, KDI, which has been ranking as the top think tank in Asia. We also have excellent pool of faculty. Many of them are graduates of the renowned World University. And also, many of them also have very hands-on government policy-making experience in the World Bank, OECD, Bank of Korea, and much more. So they can bring these very practical knowledge into the classrooms as well. I also like to mention that we're located in the new administrative capital of Korea, Sejong. So I think this is actually a great advantage for our school. There is the um, national government complex, as well as the national research complex, which has 15 national research institutes. Right? So there's a lot of active research and policy making going on in this region, and we want to bring that action into our classrooms as well, too. So we have a number of speaker series, workshops, and so on, that invite um, policy leaders, policy makers, uh, world-renowned experts in the field. Oh, and also, as you can see, we're located in the center of the Korean Peninsula, so you can easily access anywhere um, in the country, so you can have very nice, short, easy getaways during the weekends as well, too. All right, because we are one of the well-known, renowned policy schools um, in the world, we have many international students joining us, and in fact, about half of our student body every year are international students, representing 60 countries. We also have students from diverse, with diverse background, not only in the government and the public sector, but also from NGO, IGO, private sector, the media, and so on. We really strive to build a very diverse and inclusive community. 
And there are a lot of mutual learning going on uh, within the classrooms as well, too. Because of our diverse student body, we also boost vast global alumni expert. We have 2,700 international alumni representing 140 countries in the world. So this very close relationship and support system um, that goes within this alumni network is one of our key assets of the school. We also have global partnership pool of international institutions and partner universities, which can really help enrich our students' international experiences. Our school actively provides internship opportunities, um, and I think the sheer volume of the internship that goes on reflects our school's academic excellence, as well as the outstanding achievements by our students. We also have numerous research labs led by the faculty members of the school which can help really bridge the research that goes on with the teaching that takes place in the school. We also provide excellent um, educational support. Uh, we have writing center, e-learning platforms, and as I mentioned, we have a lot of special lectures inviting the practitioners to the school. We have career development service center, and also there is a global master's uh, Yes, Global Master's Program, GMP, where the Korean um, mid-level government officials and the private sector managers can study one year at the KDI school and one year overseas in one of our partner universities. We also have excellent learning facilities. Uh, we have group study rooms, the computer lab, and our library is truly excellent. It has been awarded the best university library from the Korean Ministry of Education. Not only is it about learning at the KDI school, um, there are many active social activities going on. And we have um, song and dance festival and international food festival, which has been made possible basically because of our such diverse student body. We also have a number of student forums and the buddy programs as well too. So we strive to do our best to make sure that you have not only great education experience, but also enjoy your life here at Sejong as well. All right, so now programs being offered. We offer four master's programs and three PhD programs. So we have Master of Public Policy, Development Policy, Public Management, and Intellectual Property and Development Policy. And under each of these degree programs, we have concentrations ranging from public finance, sustainable development, international development, public administration, and so forth. Um, and as I mentioned before, and this is very important, right, because uh, we are very proud to launch, have launched this dual concentration in data science for public policy and management, in short, uh, DSPPM. And we believe uh, data science is becoming an increasingly important tool for many of the public policy makers um, to have. Our PhD program is consisted of two full-time programs, um, PhD in public policy, and development policy. We also re recently, we also have part-time PhD program called um, Public Policy and Management. However, this is only open for Koreans. Let me also remind you that MIPD program and PhD programs are only open for the spring admission. So if you're interested in these programs, uh, please apply um, this semester, I mean this uh, September. All right, um, lastly, the admission schedule for the year 2023. Um, our admissions will be open from September 1st to the 23rd. Uh, please apply online and refer to, oh, sorry, <laughs> refer to our website for more details. And I also want to point out that our admission is usually larger for the spring admissions intake than the fall admissions. So I really encourage you to apply uh, this September. All right, that was very brief um, introduction to our school, and yet I hope I managed to convince some of you uh, to apply to our school. All right, next there will be some course introductions by our faculty members, and the first professor that will be making the presentation will be Professor Park jae -yuk. So please join me in welcoming Professor Park to the podium. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Jay Park, Park, uh, core faculty member in data science program in KDI School, and great to see you all. And hopefully you're enjoying this kind of long presentation, and yeah, and you also enjoyed a lot of good food out there. And I'm still waiting for it after this, I'll probably join it. Yeah, uh, so before I introduce my actual machine learning course, I'd love to briefly introduce our data science concentration. Honestly, many schools these days, especially in Korea, are opening data science program and mostly for the people who majored computer science. Then watch the essential differences between those and our programs. Yep. Same as our other programs, this concentration is also for the people who have expertise in public policy and management. So the whole class is aim to answer how we can utilize the state-of-art computational techniques like network analysis, machine learning, and data visualization to analyze and design public policy and management. And also, because it's for non-computer science background people, the courses started from very basic programming, like using Python and R. And those were for practical purposes, and also all of those courses are for practical purposes in actual policy design and analysis. Most classes in data science classes are focusing on hands-on practice project using real world cases. So if you are working, you have worked on some specific organizations, then you can find your own project or your own questions and you can apply a lot of different data science techniques to your own problems. And ultimately, so we aim to nurture students into potential data scientists in public policy and management. Oops. So yeah, okay, let's talk about machine learning classes as an example. If you're interested in machine learning, probably you already heard about those words like random forest, support vector machine, XGBoost, CNN, BERT, and etc. Actually, many people are talking about using this kind of fancy algorithms. Where are people talking about why and when do we need them? I mean, there are a lot of other statistical methods, existing methods, like, you know, logistic regressions and other multiple regression models. And then why and when do we need them? And what are the advantage of using those techniques? So here, for the very pragmatic and practical use, we are learning when and why in, do we need, actually we need these machine learning algorithms and how we can prepare for the data sets called pre-processing, the features and things to get the better answers. And so ultimately we have to use, uh, we have to nurture the students to use those machine learning analysts for the, like, uh, uh, using those machine learning algorithms in very practical cases and they understand when and why they use it. So yeah, this is a brief introduction of machine learning class, and if you have any questions for machine learning class or other classes in data science concentrations, I'm happy to get, uh, answer all those questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. Next, Professor Joon Kim, who will talk about the PhD program, especially on Advanced Research Method 2. Please welcome her to the stage. Okay, this is not moving. Can you hear me well? Okay, hi, I'm Joon Kim, and I'm an assistant professor at KDI School, and I normally teach three courses, which is Gender and Development, Social Inequalities, and Advanced Research Method 2, which I will be introducing today. So um, this course, as you can see from this slide, is also known as writing for publication. This course is offered in fall, either fall or uh, summer semester, so not spring semester. This course is designed to assist uh, students to fully understand the entire research process, as well as um, successfully write an academic research paper. So this course is offered to PhD students, right? PhD students who need to write a high quality dissertation chapter. Um, I also mentioned in these slides that it's PhD students who took foundation of public policy course, which uh, will be offered by Professor Min Sung Kang, who is sitting over there. 
And uh, also, I mentioned about have specific research question. Sometimes in my class, I have students, first year uh, PhD students or master's students who come to the class without knowing what they want to do for their research. However, in this course, we start um, by evaluating. This course begins by evaluating uh, your research question and then how to improve uh, them with students and I together. So it's going to be quite challenging for those people who don't have specific research question. And by the end of this course, you will have a first draft of your dissertation chapter. So PhD students are normally asked to write three chapters of dissertation, right? And you will half complete of one of your chapter in this course. And I mentioned half complete because sometimes in some cases it's very difficult to access and manage data sets and even complete entire analysis. And 10 weeks is not going to be enough. So I said half complete in this course. And the course structure is the following. The first week, we will dedicate how to come up with a proper research question. So some students have these interesting and amazing research ideas. However, um, it's sometimes either not testable, feasible, or not important, either uh, practically or theoretically. <laughs> so uh, we are going to work together uh, to think about how to make a proper research question. And then the remaining nine weeks, uh, we are going to do how to write a paper. And then the second part is whole research um, process. So each course, each session is divided into two sessions. Half is dedicated to how to write a paper. It's about what to do, what not to do uh, in writing introduction, literature review, methodology, and so on. And then the second half is about research design, data management, and multiple types of um, quantitative methodologies. So here, quantitative methodologies include uh, multiple types of regression analysis, matching methods, and longitudinal analysis, such as fixed effect methods, using Stata. And the final product, students will be mainly evaluated by their final drafts. So we are going to have quizzes from time to time, but mainly they're going to be evaluated by the quality of your final paper. So this is the end. If you have any questions, feel free to send me email or ask me a question during Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kim. Now, Professor Yumin Ju will come up to the stage again to introduce Master of Public Policy program focusing on smart cities. Right, um, hello again. <laughs> so I usually teach um, courses that are related to urban planning policy, anything that has to do with cities. And one of my courses is titled Smart Cities. And I think many of you probably heard about this very popularized term, smart city, right? In this course, we'll be looking at this concept from various different perspectives. We'll be talking about its potential advantages as well as the challenges and pitfalls and explore a number of case studies um, of smart city projects. So as a student in a public policy school, why should you care about smart cities? Well, in fact, I believe that cities have been getting a lot of attention in the public policy making circles. And it's because a lot of difficult and challenging, um, difficult problems and challenges are taking place in cities. We're living in an urbanized world now where more than half of the world population live in cities. And so that leads to difficult policy problems like heavy transportation congestions, pollutions, and cities are also the places where they are very prone to natural disasters, which I think will be you know, increasing a phenomenon given the climate change, right? At the same time, if you flip yeah, other side, to the other side of the coin, this basically means if we strive to build better cities, then we might be able to address some of these really um, difficult and challenging policy problems, right? So cities have been receiving, lime, receiving limelight as the you know, potential problem solvers uh, in today's urbanized world. And I think smart cities is um, part of this kind of solution that people have been selling. Right, given the advanced technology uh, in today's society. And indeed, we're seeing the rise of smart cities. Right? All the 
you know, cities that you heard of, like London, Paris, New York, Tokyo, Seoul, et cetera, as well as many countries in developing cities, I mean, <laughs> sorry, cities in developing countries are launching um, smart city initiatives. Not only that, we are seeing um, consulting firms like McKinsey or the IT giants really pushing to spread the smart city idea, um, seeing this as a great market potential. And we see a lot of international um, conferences that try to promote and spread this um, idea of smart city as a solution to many of the problems that we face today. But exactly what is a smart city? Is there a very clear definition? And what are the policy implications? So again, throughout the course, we'll be discussing um, some of these issues. So we'll look at smart cities from different angles as a corporate smart city, citizen-centric smart cities, or government-led smart city projects. Uh, we'll be looking at Living Labs, one of the important tools of creating smart cities, and also how these globally spreading idea of smart cities are you know, being implemented on the ground given the local specific context. Right? And most, uh, last but not least, we also look at the key challenges and pitfalls, like the cybersecurity issues, the increasing digital divide, and really the fundamental question of, is the technology the solution for the, many of the problems that we face in our um, cities today? And throughout the course, students will be engaging in researching on specific smart city projects that they're interested in, and we'll be sharing those case studies as well, too. So in the end, we'll end up um, exploring different concepts, arguments surrounding smart cities, um, and also look at the policies regarding the smart city projects, as well as the numerous case studies from um, both developed and developing countries. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ju. Next, Professor In Bo Ri will talk about topics in political economy of development, a course offered in Master of Development Policy program. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is In Bo Ri, and I'm a political scientist uh, studying mostly issues related to developing countries. And today I'll be talking about one of my courses, which is titled Topics in Political Economy of Development. It'd be really nice if I can just pop out this microphone and walk around you a little bit, just to make things a little bit more engaging and interesting. I feel very far away from you, but I'll try my best to at least talk a little bit more about my course better. So why this course? We are looking at a lot of variations in terms of the levels of development around the world. Here you see a map uh, that pictures the different countries, uh, colors the different countries uh, in terms of their levels of development. We can see there are some countries like the United States, which is very, very blue, whereas others, we have countries that are light yellowish, light greenish. So we have vast amount of variation in terms of how countries are performing uh, in their economic dimensions. Here we have uh, the kind of similar uh, information. Uh, looking at the overall sort of temporal dimension of the development across different countries. And we see some countries like, this is very far away from me, but say the United States and some of the European countries up top, uh, and you'll also find South Korea uh, somewhere closer to the top, and right at the bottom, North Korea as well. So what explains these vast amount of difference in terms of how countries are performing today and the trajectory as to how they got to uh, the current uh, today's position? So experts say there are a number of different reasons, like geography, markets, public health, technology, human capital, or physical capital. In fact, some people claim that we already know what works, and it's just a matter of uh, resources to solve this problem. So here, uh, some of you may recognize these faces. We have Jeffrey Sachs and Bono, uh, the once uh, famous <laughs> a singer, maybe still uh, pretty popular, uh, a vocal of YouTube, uh, U2. And here, let me read the quote. They go on to say, the wealth of the rich world and the power of knowledge can make the end of poverty a realistic possibility by 2025. So this is a very strong statement, a very particular, almost deterministic statement that's, that's suggesting that we know what to do. If and only if we can get the resources of the rich nations to get poured into the poor nations, we can solve this problem of world poverty by a specific date. And we only have three years left to actually realize their goal. 
based on that kind of understanding, what people have suggested is almost this really nicely led out uh, infographic, if you will, uh, with color codes, like say, no poverty, zero hunger, quality education, gender equality. Again, we have specific goals, and for each of these different goals, we have specific sub-goals and different resources that people need. And if and only if we do that, we will be able to solve all these problems. As a political scientist, however, I think that we live in a much, much more messy world. Things are not as clean. There are all sorts of problems. Corruption, clientelism, vote buying, polarization, inequality. All of these things actually hinder meeting those goals in a very clean and optimistic manner. So in this course, I'd like to uh, focus a lot more on the root causes of development, uh, especially thinking about political institutions and behavior, uh, and specifically thinking more about kind of the dirty topics in development, not the fancy ones where we can say that we know the answers, but thinking more about what are the actual problems uh, that makes us much more difficult to get to those answers, like colonial history, like corruption, like clientelism, like violence, co uh, coercion, conflict, and lack of trust or social capital. So if you're interested in following me, say yes and uh, roll a sign in for my course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ri. Last but not least, Professor Jun Su Lee will take the stage to introduce public organizations and management, one of the core courses in Master of Public Management program. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Chun Su Lee, Associate Professor of KDN School. Now, I am introducing you to uh, one of the required courses of MPM program uh, titled P Public Organizations Management, in short, POM. Um, well, uh, this is the core question uh, we want to uh, answer throughout this course. Who is public manager and what does he or she do and how? As you can see here, there are two groups of stakeholders. Uh, citizens as principals, and public managers as agents. So we will consider these two groups of stakeholders, how they will interact with each other. So today I will introduce uh, three images of POM. Um, the very first image is complexity of mission and environment. A very widely, widely held view, what a held uh, myth in terms of um, POM is that public managers can control environment surrounding their missions. But we all know that this is not true. More often, um, public managers are like um, Alice in Wonderland because they have to deal with ever-changing environment to achieve their own missions. So how can you address, address these challenges? In this course, POM, we will discuss decision-making, uh, performance management, and strategic management. The second image of POM is the constraints of intra-organization. The second myth of POM is that public managers, uh, especially master of public management like you, uh, are all powerful magicians, but we all know that this is not true. Uh, more often, we are like uh, Pinocchio's on strings. In other words, public managers should work under constraint. What kind of constraint? Constraint in terms of resources, in terms of team, in terms of culture and ethics. So um, public managers should work and should have very uh, excellent uh, leadership. Finally, the th uh, third image of POM is the collaboration of inter-organizations. The, the last myth is that public managers are the sole players. They are working alone, but this is not true. More often, public managers should work and interact and collaborate with others who are also under their own constraint. So to address these challenges, we will discuss networks, politics, and governance um, throughout this course. So summing up, um, <laughs> the word master, uh, in the master of public management or public, uh, pol public policy, something like that, master, this word is, can be quite misleading because even after you graduate from this school, uh, you cannot be an all-powerful magician. The reality will remain quite uncontrollable. But ironically, public managers are still expected to manage something unmanageable. So what shall we do? Um, this program, this course, is designed to help you become not an all-powerful magician, 
the versatile leader who can recognize and analyze the reality of public management more systematically. So this is the gist of POM course. We, all faculty members, we are hoping to see you all in the near future in the class. Okay, thank you. Thank you, professors. I'm sure the participants here today had a glimpse of the programs we offer at KDI School. Next, two of our students will briefly talk about their campus life at KDI School. Please welcome Fitrian Archita Noor, 2020 Fall MDP student to the stage. Hello, uh, can you hear me well? <laughs> okay. So, let me begin presentation. So, um, I'm Archita Nurfitrian, MDP 2020 Fall, and I just graduated from KDA School this month, and I got a job, uh, and I work now in UNESCO Asia Pacific of Education uh, in Seoul, South Korea, and, um, and I was a uh, scholarship from Korean government scholarship here, you can see. So, uh, before I came to KDI, I was searching about a scholarship in Korea, and then I found the website. This, this, that, that time, it, it was in 2019. It was a scholarship from Korean government scholarship, so I, I applied for a scholarship, and it was like two years program in a Master of Development Policy in KDI School. So after I got a scholarship, I began my journey uh, in one year Korean language program in other universities, and I start uh, the journey two years in KDI school. So this is my life as a KDI student. And in KDI school, basically, it's not just study. I was not just studying in, uh, in the classroom, but I have I made connections, and and what is, what I was so surprised in in KD school because I am, I can be friends with my professor. So uh, sometimes they invite us for dinner and or for lunch, and we have talk uh, uh, talk a lot about many things, and and I came to KD school also surprised that there are so many students from around the world here. I can make connection from students from Europe, uh, uh, Latin America, so it's Asian countries. So I brought in my uh, opportunities and my connection here. And also, uh, and as uh, professors as, uh, mentioned earlier that there are so many social activities in Korean school. So here there's a picture that I and my country mates joined the Korea Song and Dance Festival. And it was so much fun because we got to know other cultures from different countries. And we also can perform what we have in our country to other uh, students and other uh, the professor. And, and I was so surprised also. There's a picture that we celebrated our Independence Day. And, and here, there are so many also Indo uh, Indonesian students that I didn't expect before. So we, ha uh, we can celebrate our uh, Independence Day together here. And there's also, oh, in KDS School, uh, there's not, uh, I can broaden my opportunities and, and not only my network, but I can uh, join competition. There is actually, when I came to KDS School, there are so many announcements that you can join internship, uh, competitions, and, uh, uh, and like some, uh, I mean, workshop, uh, international workshop. So I and my, fri I and my, and my friend decided there was, was announcement about competitions, uh, but related to environment, because I was really interested about environment and development policy. So I and my friend looked at the announcement that the KDI school, in the KDI school notice board, and we decided to join Asia Pacific environmental competitions. Uh, at the time, uh, when, I, when we participated, we, we only did like uh, the best for uh, the best. So uh, we didn't expect that we win the second uh, winner at that time. 
And also in cadet school, I live in dormitory. And to improve my uh, leadership skills, I became a dormitory assistant for one year because there was two years program of study in KDS school and I started to apply as a dormitory assistant to improve my leadership skills. So, uh, and the last, the last year, uh, I became a, a dormitory assistant and I engaged with a broader, uh, broader knowledge of uh, like people, be, uh, behavior, like from over the world. So yeah, we engage, I engage with them and then I, it, was, it was so fun. And, and of course, there's so many um, uh, that problems that we didn't know before it happened in dormitory and then how we solved that problem. So it, it really improved my leadership, leadership a lot. So thanks to that, and then this. This is the end of my study in KDS school. After I spent two years studying Master of Development Policy in KDS school, I finally uh, uh, submitted my research project, and then I graduated this August, and this is the picture of the MI completion ceremony. Uh, just, it, was just, it was just held like 8th of August this month. And that's my journey in KDS school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Vitrian. Next, please welcome Sang Eun Lee, 2021 Spring MDP student to the stage. Um, hello, uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sang Eun Lee and I'm 2021 MDP student. Uh, before I uh, move on, I need to tell you one story. Um, three years ago in 2019, I was right here um, as a participant, uh, actually. Uh, but at that time, listening to um, the speech from KDI students, I, was, I made up my mind to come to KDI school. But now I'm here as a student uh, presenter, and I'm really honored and grateful for this opportunity. So let me first uh, begin with uh, my journey to the KDI school. Uh, before coming to KDI school, I majored in international studies and economics in college. And in my junior year at college, I went to Tanzania to work as a student intern for COTRA, Korea Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. And there, uh, in the weekend, I, I had a chance to um, volunteer in a program giving out free meals to underprivileged children at Village. Uh, by looking at uh, the children who were struggling against hunger, I um, asked my, my, myself, uh, what can I do and how can I contribute to uh, make a better world? So with, after then, I worked for COICA, uh, Korea International Cooperation Agency, for uh, five, five months again. And, and then after, after then, I, with the uh, further desire to study d development policy, I made up my mind to come to KDI school. Um, so this is, this is the left picture as um, when I was volunteering, and the right one is when I was working for Koika in Senegal office. So uh, let me uh, share my <laughs> yeah <laughs> my my campus life with um, campus life uh, at three perspectives. One uh, first one is uh, about academic life. Um, here in KDI school, you can will you will have a very active class discussions. Um, students from all around the world, uh, they really enjoy and love to discuss and share their um, different opinions here. I know that some of you may hesitate to speak up in class because what, uh, I was one of them at first, but professors encouraged me to uh, participate in class discussions, uh, saying that there is no um, right or wrong thoughts. And I remember one day Professor Yun, Chun Gun Yoon, uh, during his class, uh, said that, uh, please do not afraid of speaking up in class. 
and do not be afraid of um, asking any questions because class is the best and um, most, the most safe place to practice. So I, KDI uh, school helped me to practice, to discuss, and um, express my opinions with other people. And also, secondly, uh, you can deepen your knowledge um, in specific topics uh, which you are interested in, such as ICT policy or urban policy or gender equality or uh, other data methodologies. Um, for me, I, I, I took almost every courses related to institutions uh, where I could learn how economic and political institutions affect development. And also, uh, you can earn data methodology skills um, because we, uh, KDI School provides uh, very, uh, several courses regarding, um, our, regarding uh, data, data management skills, uh, such as R or STATA. And lastly, you can also um, attend special lectures or conferences and broaden to, uh, to broaden your perspectives. Uh, the picture uh, there is the uh, one I when I was uh, when I went to uh, Korean administration conference this semester with Professor Chun Gun Yoon and other two uh, PhD students, and I presented uh, my research topic there uh, in one of the sessions. Yeah, it was a very good experience for me. And secondly, uh, you will have some research uh, opportunities here in KDI School. Um, I worked for, uh, worked, worked for re one research lab, Conflict and Development Lab, and also I worked as an RFO for individual research topics with Professor Han, Baran Han and uh, Chun Gun Yoon. And you, of course you'll get an RA scholarship. Um, and what you'll do as an RA, uh, you will I, I did, um, I, I reviewed and summarized the literature related to the research topics and also you, I tried to add my own opinions and insights to the research and I also did um, data cleaning with the R or SATA skills that I earned from the courses here in KDI school. And, um, and looking back, I think um, my time and effort that I put as an RA um, has been a stepping stone to conduct my own research. And last but not least, uh, networking opportunities. Um, here in KDI School, we have a body program which matches one international and one Korean student. And the last two pictures, are, there is a Larissa, uh, who is my buddy, uh, from Rwanda. We, we visited uh, hi several historical sites in Korea, uh, such as Gyeongbok, Gyeongbok Palace, Gyeongbokgung. And she also visited my home and, and visited my family. And they, uh, we had a really uh, good time together. You can see uh, my little doggy there. <laughs> and the students there uh, in KDI school, they're all um, experts from their own backgrounds, their own fields. So, and I think in develop, as, a st as a student studying in development policy, I think it is very important to um, have a thorough understanding about uh, political and economical and historical backgrounds in developing countries. And they, um, international students here in KDI school, they help us um, to have better understand have, have a better understanding about the situation uh, in the real life there. And also, uh, as a general student, um, KDS school graduates uh, come to uh, host, uh, hold some kind of special lectures for career development and they uh, help us and guide us with the career uh, building, uh, career building opportunities. So um, looking back, uh, with the interest and desire to further study of uh, development policy, I came to KDI school. And here I could acquire uh, three main things, uh, knowledge and research experience and networking here. And now I started to work for a public organization, National Information Society Agency. 
uh, NIA in our po uh, policy planning team. And I still dream to go uh, another step further uh, to make a better world. And I believe that KDA school um, will, KDA school has been, um, connect, has been connecting the dots and will bring me a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you.